will look down from the sky. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we have much to do, and we, we are not sure we will be ready for the day of your coming. And Abbot's light helps us to see what is important, to be who you, to be who you want us to be, and to do what you, want, what you would have us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Is promises. 
the story, uh, a little bit of background about one of the greatest uh, Christmas hymns that we sing today. So, uh, would you, Deborah, would you show that video now? Joseph Moore was the priest of a town called Muritva. The Napoleonic Wars had brought chaos to Austria, and Moore's congregation was suffering from the devastating consequences. Not only had the war overwhelmed Moore's congregation, but in 1815 they had suffered through the year without a summer, after an Indonesian volcano blanketed Europe in black clouds, causing storms, summer blizzards, failed crops, and extensive famine. This left Moore's congregation impoverished, starving and feeling hopeless. So Moore set out to write a poem to show his church that God still cared for them and to help them feel hope for the future. The poem he wrote was Still Night or Silent Night. Moore enlisted the help of his friend, Franz Gruber, to compose music for his poem. The majority of Moore's congregation worked along the Storzak River some were boat crews, some had jobs shipping salt, and others just worked near the river. The river and the flowing water was a fundamental part of their life. To effect this, Weber composed the music for Silent Night in an Italian style known as Siciliana. Originating in Sicily, the Siciliana style was designed to mimic the sound of water and rolling waves. Weber's composition for Silent Night effectively evokes the feeling of water the song breathes with the river. Gruber's music has another beautiful effect in the hymn. In the book of John, when talking with a Samaritan woman, Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as living water. He says, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Silent Night is a peaceful portrayal of Jesus' birth, and through Gruber's use of the Siciliana style, he ensured that the living water also flowed through Silent Night. The feeling of gentle waves imbued in Silent Night not only represents the flow of the Salzach River, but also embodies the very nature of the Holy Spirit.
Let's sing together now.
all uh, peaches and cream and, and glory, hallelujah, and all of a sudden we realize sin is still present to some capacity as a new believer in our our faith is, uh, as a baby in Christ, is, you know, we kind of maybe call in the question, wait a minute, did I, did I really get saved or what? You know, why am I still having problems with it? And then we talk about the neutralized believer who, who uh, is making some headway and then finds that there is a bondage there to sin that it's just persistent. It just won't go away. It won't stop. And we succumb to the temptations that... Uh, that are confronting us on a daily basis. And so to, to hear the message today that there is power in the name of Jesus, power through the Holy Spirit, power to have victory over sin. And we can break free from the dominion of sin. And so today we're looking at Romans chapter 6. It's there in your bullets in verses 12 through 18. And we're going to read this passage, if you would, in honor of the Word of God, would you stand as we read these few verses in Romans 6, verses 12 through 18. The Word of God says this, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We just uh, passed a, an observation of a day that is imprinted upon our national consciousness, and that is a date of December 7th, a day that will live in infamy. It was the day that the Japanese Imperial forces uh, blew up Pearl Harbor and uh, was our start to the entry of World War II. It was a long war. It lasted uh, at least four years, if not longer. And uh, it was the war that really was our parents' generation to have participated in and bought in. My daddy was in World War II, serving in the Navy. And uh, I know many of you had family that served during that uh, conflict and that ordeal. Well, Teruo Nakamura and Hiro Onoda were two Japanese soldiers, that when the war ended in 18, uh, 1845, <laughs> boy, that was a backwards war, no, when it ended in, in uh, 1945, they dropped leaflets over the areas that uh, the Japanese forces had been occupying and had been uh, waging warfare in, uh, over there in near the China Sea. A couple of these Japanese soldiers did not believe the announcements that, of the leaflets that the emperor had surrendered and the war was over. And they didn't believe it. They thought it was propaganda. So they kept fighting. And they kept fighting. One was a private that had gotten some soldiers together and they were 
waging guerrilla warfare there in the jungle. Another was a, a commander and had troops under him, and he was continuing to fight. They said, don't believe him. We've got we to gotta keep fighting. We've got to win this war. And they continued to fight. And for both those men, Nakamura and Onada, the war for them did not end until 1974. 1974. They continued to fight World War II 30 years beyond the end of the war. And one of them, the commander, said, I will not believe it unless I have someone in authority to come and relieve me of my duty. And so uh, they had located through all of these years and through the efforts of many, they had finally located where this guy was and knew where he was holed up. And the, the Japanese uh, military sent his former commander out there to the jungle and said, go relieve that man of duty, tell him the war is over. And they found him, they located him, and he finally surrendered his sword. And for him, the war was over. 30 years after it had ended. I think there's many a Christian today who does not understand that our war with sin in its full impact the war is over. It ended when Jesus Christ on the cross took upon himself all of the sin of the world. He took upon every sin that you have committed, you're committing now or will commit tomorrow. In every generation, every person, it was laid upon Christ, all of the sin of the world, and he died. And when he screamed from the cross, his final words, that the next time, it is finished. It's finished. And as if to accentuate and punctuate that truth, three days later, he busted out of the tomb. And he won the victory. The Bible says he took the keys of death and of hell and the grave. And today we serve a victorious Jesus Christ who has won the victory. And he won it a couple of thousand years ago. And uh, all of us are fighting as if we're in some kind of guerrilla warfare, hiding behind the tree. And we're still struggling with sin, struggling with sin, not knowing we can be set free from the power of sin in our lives. We don't have to keep putting up with that stuff. We can have the victory in Christ. Well, how do we get that victory? Let's let's analyze this uh, just a little bit. And I don't know about you. I, I I don't like the remedy to this. I don't like what I have to do to be able to access this victory. If you'll notice, there were used three times the same word. Oh, I can't think of a, a word more, you know, kind of like hearing the fingernails on the chalkboard, you know, in the old days. Oh. It's, yeah, cringe. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the word obey. Obey. Oh, don't you just love to obey? Don't you just love it when people tell you what to do? Oh, it just fills my heart with joy. Oh, just tell me what to do. No, I mean that 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 Mario inside of me, he hears somebody say, you know, you need to da 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 and I go. No, I don't. Watch me not do it. Don't tell me to do it, Joseph. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to yell for the Cowboys today. You can't make me. And the 
more you tell me to do it, the more I'm going to not do it. <laughs> and yet this is exactly what the Apostle Paul does. There is no middle ground here. He says it's either or. It's not both and. You and I love to live in both and. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey today if it's to my advantage for me to obey. But if it's not to my advantage, well, let me take it under consideration. Let me see if I, that's something that I would, wouldn't, yeah, what's in it for me? You know, what, I wouldn't mind doing that. Well, I want you to notice there's a new mandate to obey. He says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Do not do it. There's a don't and a do. The don't is don't let it rain. Don't do it. Do present yourselves alive as if you're alive from the dead. Oh, listen. Um, some of us don't understand the idea of, you, you know, um, Paul said it this way to the Galatians. He said that we're to daily crucify ourselves. We have to, exactly, we have to die to ourselves. Our self wants to live, so, I mean, we just want to be the boss. We want to be in control. We want to have the final word. You can't tell me what to do. And yet, Paul says, crucify that, that desire to do that every single day. Jesus said, take up your cross daily. Take up your cross daily. There's no middle ground in this uh, mandate to obey. Oh, don't we just love mandates? We've just recently, historically, lived through a mask mandate. Do you know that in February of 2021, the CDC issued a mandate that all uh, of the public that is using public transportation or out in public areas were mandated to wear masks. And that was not lifted until May of this year. It didn't expire until May of 2023. And don't you love how that mandate was handed down to us? Uh, my brother-in-law said, uh, when we were all showing up and, and seeing each other during those days, you know, we were masked up, some of us, many of us, not all of us. And I noticed that he had on a mask around his neck, but it was not on his mouth or nose. I said, Stacy? Uh, you're not wearing your mask. And he said, oh, I am wearing it. Can't you see? It's around my neck. I'm wearing a mask. And I was like, ah, I understand. He was wearing a mask. It was just not over his nose and his mouth. For over two years, we had that mask mandate. And don't you... Don't you know that that was just one of the joyous things that you got to do every single day, right? Now, we don't like to obey. There is this, don't do this, but do this. And in this particular case, uh, it is a life and death situation. You do the one, you die. You do the other, you live. Alma Rose was a violinist, an excellent violinist, and she, uh, in World War II, ended up in a German concentration camp. And they were lining up people on a daily basis to uh, kill them in the gas chambers and to, uh, to destroy their lives. And she wanted to, at least one more time, played her violin. She was an accomplished violinist and somehow through uh, the, the things that were rounded up as they were rounding up the people uh, to put into these prison camps, they got a hold of a violin and so she made 
made two or three inquiries and and she ended up having a violin in her possession. And so after the guards had left on this particular evening, she had that violin in her possession. She took it out, she tuned it up, and she began to play the most beautiful music you've ever heard. Just gorgeous. And then uh, others began to surface and say, well, I, I play the flute, or I play the, the viola, or I played this other instrument. And, and soon in that concentration camp, there began to be a little uh, orchestra put together. And the, the command, the commandant had allowed that to happen. But it literally was a situation where they had to perform or they were dead. Friends, listen to me. This life and death situation with sin, we got to do it. We we can't we can't mess around. If we if we let sin reign, it will bring death. We have to actually present ourselves. We have to present our bodies, present our members, our minds, our heart, our will, our emotions. I mean the, the emotions. Um, today are out of control. There was a song that I uh, enjoyed when it came out. I liked it because uh, I knew the girl's daddy uh, that sang it, her name, uh, that sang the song was Debbie Boone. And I grew up with a guy named Pat Boone. And uh, we actually went to the same university together up in Denton at North Texas. And uh, he was famous. He was a North, famous North Texas grad. And Debbie sang this song. It was a great hit. It was called You Light Up My Life. You light up my life. And then one of the lines says, it can't be wrong when it feels so right. <laughs> the Greek word for that is baloney. <laughs> I'm here to tell you, sin can feel so right. Oh, it feels so good. It's a life and death situation. You either perform or you die. You either present your body alive to, the, to God and to allow the Holy Spirit to rule and reign over your mortal body or you die. It's an either or. It's not a both and. But not only that, there's not only a new mandate to obey, there's a new motivation to obey. We've got a new motivation here. He says, uh, verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under law, but under grace. You used to be under this operating system, where you had this whole list of things that you had to do, do this, do this, do this, do this, in order to please God. In order to show that you were uh, one of his followers. And then, as we know again in Galatians, the law was given as a tutor. It was given to show us that we can't keep it. We can't do all those things. We need a Savior. We do fail. When it says, thou shalt have no other gods before me, and yet... That's all we do is put everything else before God. There's many a Christian who's essentially a, a functioning atheist. We go in through life, living life, without giving any regard whatsoever to God being in the equation. And we live like an atheist, as if, as if there is no God. We do that every time we don't acknowledge him. Every time we, we, we need to constantly be aware that the Lord is with us. He is in us. His life is in us. We have a new motivation to, to obey. It's, it's a little bit like a, a dare in the sense that uh, you've got, okay, you can try and keep the law, but I, I, I dare you to try and keep it. Or I dare you to, to push grace.
grace beyond the limits. This is what some want to do. This is like, uh, okay, so wait a minute. We're under grace now. That means I can sin and do whatever I want. This is awesome. And God forgives me. This is great. Let's party. Because after all, we're under grace and God will, God will forgive that. Reminds me a little bit about some of uh, our states that have a catch and release with a zero amount of dollars bail. They catch the criminal. They release them for no money whatsoever. So they can get together and go into a shopping mall or into a store and just wipe the thing out with trash, start filling trash bags full of things and walk out the door because there's no consequence whatsoever. It's not good. And, and you would think that um, somehow or another a criminal would say, well, well this, this is great. That means, okay, if I, if I don't have any consequence like that, uh, gosh, that means I can do kind of what I think is right. And, and, and I think it's right for me to go in there and clean the place out. It's, 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 it's like we're daring the law and we're daring grace to just take complete advantage of it. And we don't need to do that. We don't need to do that. It's a new motivation. Our motivation ought to be that we now have this God who has forgiven us, who, who will continue to forgive us, but who wants us to choose to do and to perform the right things. I was thinking about this idea of daring uh, someone. You know, the there was a guy back in Kentucky who had developed kind of a playground of uh, uh, unwritten rules, if you will, on how to how to do a dare. You know, if uh, if you're out there on the playground and someone says, "Well, I'm going to jump from this monkey bar to that monkey bar," and he said, "Well, I dare you to do." And then, and they say, "Well, I dare you to do it." And they go back and forth. Well, I, I double dare you to do it. And then I double dog dare you to do it. And in the Christmas story, they uh, had to get that one boy. He was going to put his tongue to the frozen cold. And he, he didn't accept the dare until they said, I triple dog dare you to do it. And the boys on the playground were like, oh, wow. And in order to save face, the guy said, okay. And so he put his tongue to the frozen pole and the bell rang and it was time for them to go back inside after a recess. This boy was stuck to the pole. They had to call 911. <laughs> See, we do things. We do things anymore uh, that when the Holy Spirit is in us, they need to be prompted by the Holy Spirit. They don't need to be coming and emanating from our own mind. Well, I think this is a good idea. I think this is the this is the solution for it. Or this is what I feel. I'm going with my feelings here. No, our motivation ought to be not to dare the Lord and to presume. We talked about this last week when the devil took Jesus on top of the temple and said, just jump right on down. And the Lord said, no, you don't tempt the Lord your God. We don't presume upon him coming through for us in this way. But not only is there a new mandate to obey and a new motivation to obey, but there's a new master to obey. Would you notice in verse 16, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves? I hate what slavery has done not only in our nation, but around the world. There are, do you know that there are nations still yet today where slavery is in full force. 
Human slavery and human trafficking is taking place even now as we speak. People enslaved in things and forced to, to uh, follow the dictates of those that own them. But in this particular case, Paul is saying, listen, you used to be a slave to sin, to that sin master, that taskmaster. You don't have to do that anymore because you've been set free and you can now, and, and what, what do we think right away? Well, I'm free. I don't, I, I'm not a slave anymore. I can do whatever I want. No, guess what? We have a new master. And it's not us. The new master is Jesus. And just like we used to serve sin and be a slave to sin to please ourselves. No, we now have this new motivation to please our new master. And to be enslaved to him. One of the things that uh, happened way back yonder in my pilgrimage with... Uh, being a clergy person, is uh, many of the Methodist clergy would wear the Roman collar. And I don't know, I, I think you know what I'm talking about, the priest-looking collar thing. It's got the little white deal there in the center. And uh, it's called the Roman collar. The, the Lutheran collar is a little different. It's got the wraparound white. Um, but the Roman collar, and so my, my uncle, who was... Uh, an Episcopalian priest, uh, loved to wear his, his collar. And uh, I asked him one time, I said, Theo, I'm going to do a, a, a wedding, and I'm thinking about wearing the collar because the people that I'm doing the wedding for, most, if not all, of the family and friends are not church people. And, uh, and, and I thought it might, it might strike some kind of visual for them if I wore that Roman collar. I said, what do you think about that? And he says, do you know what that represents? I said, no, I don't. I mean, it, to me, it just makes you look like a priest. And he goes, they used to call that a dog collar. And it's based on the collar that the slaves wore in the Roman times where they would have been chained and the masters could just tug on them and pull them in any direction that they want, and they would go. It's a symbol of being a servant. It's a symbol of being a slave. But instead of a slave to sin, it's a slave to our Lord and Savior, our new master. And so uh, I don't think I'll freak you all out by wearing a Roman collar anytime soon. <laughs> But I want you to know that you and I have, if you will, a spiritual collar that all of us are to wear. We're not set free to do whatever the heck we want to do. And, and chalk it off to grace. As if we've been double or dog dared or triple dog dared to do something stupid. And say, well, God will forgive me. No, we're to obey. We've been commanded to obey. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He didn't say, if you love me, you know, come to church every Sunday and raise your hand and sing the song. No, he said, keep my commandments. Why do you call me Lord and don't do the things that I tell you to do? Oh, don't you just love the word obey? Oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> On January the 1st, 1863, I got the right number. Now. January 1st, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln declared, as we were right in the middle of the Civil War, he declared what is known as the Emancipation Proclamation. He said, all of the slaves free in that proclamation, even though the war was still raging. Over four million slaves officially were set free on that day by the President of the United States. But the war raged on, and the war raged on, and it was not the 
until later when finally the South surrendered and the Civil War was over, that those slaves could finally appreciate and enjoy their freedom. Now, what's fascinating is this. They were set free, but they didn't have anywhere to go. They didn't have anywhere to live. They didn't have anything to do. They didn't have any food. They didn't have any shelter. And so many of them just stayed right where they were on the plantation and continued to work as low-paid employees earning low wages because they didn't know anything else. Listen, friends, I'm concerned for many a Christian who after having been liberated by what Christ has done for us, we want to continue. we've just grown so accustomed to sin and so accustomed to slavery to that sin that we don't understand we've been set free and we can move to any part of the country we want and we can start over and we can build a new life. Oh, but we just want to settle right back into where we've been and keep doing what we've been doing. We don't have to do that. We don't have to do that. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, do not be enslaved again in a yoke of bondage. But instead, we're yoked to the Lord. We're wearing that spiritual collar around us and saying, Lord, you just tug this way and I'll go that way. You tug this way, I'll go that way. You, you hold me back, I'll hold back. You let me loose, I'll run. Whichever direction, Lord, you want me to go, I'll go. There's a new master to obey. And we're duty bound to do that. You know, I think it's interesting that Paul left this, you know, he's, he's, he kind of starts pretty strong. I'm going to tell you what to do. Boom. Got to do it. And then he says, and the reason you got to do it is because, come on guys, we're not, we're not under law anymore. We're under grace, so just, just start in this new operating system but then he ends up this little passage right here and he says and, and the reason is the reason is your love for God what God has done in your heart he said God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin yet you obeyed from the heart you gave your heart to Jesus the word to give our minds and let him Give us a new mind. Give us the mind of Christ, a new heart, a soft heart. If we've been hard-hearted, he can make our hearts soft. Amen. And it's when you and I put our eyes on the cross, when you and I put our eyes on what Jesus has done for us, that we can experience this kind of freedom. Listen to the words of Isaac Watts as we uh, close today. He says, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast save in the death of Christ, my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them through his blood. See, from his head, his hands, his feet, Sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small? Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. We serve the Lord today. Because we love him. And we're thankful for what he's done. And we're thankful for the fact that we can be set free from the power of sin. Some of us need to access that. Come out of the jungle. Come out of the warfare. Thinking we still got to battle this thing on our own. I'm the, I'm the last living soldier to, to do this. Everybody else is no, no. You're not alone. The Holy Spirit is there. Amen. And he 
what so power you would do that. Father, this morning I pray that we would we would surrender to you. We would take this struggle that we have on a daily basis, our struggle to surrender our will, our struggle to surrender our feelings, our struggle to surrender those thoughts that plague us and keep us enslaved and keep us in bondage, Lord. I pray that you would set people free today, that they would understand that there was a great proclamation of their freedom when Christ busted out of the tomb for them and won the victory. Today, may we walk in the victory that we have through Christ and through his blood. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Some of y'all need to be free today. We're going to have our team in place to pray for you. You want to, you want to come to the altar and pray. You're welcome to come. But there's some things that have gotten you in bondage that you need to just let go. You need to let God take them over. You need to walk in His power and His forgiveness and be motivated to please Him because you love Him. Because that love translates into a, a, a way to love Him so amazingly with all of our soul and our life are all in all. You come as our praise team leads us and you do business with God today.
Oh my God. 
smaller and smaller. Praise the Lord until the new year starts. Um, please govern yourselves according to the bulletin. Um, so Christmas Eve services uh, is going to be held uh, at 1030. It is on a Sunday. So the New Testament Overview Sunday School class will not meet. All other classes will meet. So we're going to have communion and the candlelight service here on Christmas Eve at 10.30. 10.30 in the morning, yes. <laughs> so if you're visiting this morning, welcome to our services. You should have received a gift bag already. If not, I apologize. One of our members will find you. So we have gift bags for the male and female and for the, and for the boys and for the, for the girls. So also in the chair in front of you, there are these maroon cards. So please get one if you're new, we want to get to know you, give us your address, but most importantly on the back side, on the back side are prayer requests. So we have a team that meets every Wednesday to pray over your needs. And it's something that we've always done. So please let us know your, your prayer needs. Anybody in the house, just let us know your, your prayer needs. Um, I think that's about, uh, oh, uh, all of you that uh, participated or attended our Christmas party on Friday. That was amazing. So all of you that made that happen, thank you. Whatever you did. Whether you worked the station, or you baked, or or maybe you, you drove the, the truck and, and like a, and wanted me to sing, and that didn't work out so bad. But anyway, uh, what do you did that hay ride? Uh, hmm? Yes, thank you for that. So uh, we have a lot of birthdays for November. So if you have a November birthday, please stand up. Of course, one young gentleman is up in the booth recording us, so it's his birthday today. Oh. What did I say? Oh, I'm sorry, December. Okay. <laughs> okay, so if you have a November birthday, please stand up. December. Lord, around them, Father. Oh, Holy Spirit, make them, make them mindful 
of your word. Father, we have a choice to obey you or to obey self. And I pray, Lord, that we would have the courage to obey you. I thank you, Lord, and I praise you. Blessings upon each your people. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, O oh Lord. Amen. Amen. Lift Jesus high. Lift Jesus high.